Okay, so the question was, can you do this uh, commensable component analysis on discrete variables? And yes, you can, but obviously it's a bit funny because uh, uh, the model is uh, uh, got a Gaussian noise. Um, but you can change that, and you can do, uh, say, probit noise models of the type that Mark mentioned in his talk. And there's work uh, by Mike Tipping at NIPS, I think, in year 2000 or 2001. 2001, I'm seeing from the front. Um, which shows how you can do that. And actually, the same idea was then republished uh, <coughs> without knowledge of the prior work, I think, uh, initially, although I think it's now referenced by Lawrence Saul and others. And, and the idea there is just to put these sort of uh, binomial noise on the output and still have a linear model. Um, so I guess with discrete data, um, people nowadays go for things like latent Dirichlet allocation and Bayesian non-parametric foo, which um, there's a series of talks on, so I won't uh, go much further about that. I mean, that's very hot uh, at the moment. Bayesian non-parametrics, mixture models, and uh, these uh, binary latent feature, infinite binary processes, that sort of thing. So that's another sort of thing you can do. OK, so um, I'll push on with, uh, OK, so there's a notation reminder. We're going to be using more some of these guys now, so uh, as well as what we used last time, uh, we've got the similarity. Now, K for me is, is three things. It's a similarity matrix, it's a covariance matrix, and it's a kernel matrix. Uh, and H is uh, what I failed to have the slides on this time, last time, but I found them in this deck. They were in the wrong place, so I'll go through the centering matrix idea a little bit. And then a key thing is the centered similarity or kernel or covariance. B, so I use B for that. That follows uh, Mardia Kent Bibby's notation. And uh, we're going to at some point need the graph Laplacian. So, and we'll use L for that. So today is more about um, spectral approaches to dimensionality reduction. But we're going to pick up where we've left off from last time. So just the. The slides that I was missing were these ones. Consider the matrix form of the square distance. So if, you've got a, if you're computing distances in data space, this is how you might write them in a matrix form. The diagonal of the inner product matrix uh, as a vector, that's what that operation is supposed to indicate, um, times the vector of ones, minus two times the inner product plus one times the diagonal in the other way. So this is. The, from this part, you get the sort of yi transpose yi. Here, you get the minus 2 yi transpose yj. And here, you get the plus yj transpose yj in your matrix. Um, I don't know. Uh, I know. I think I've spoken to Bernard about this before. And, and he feels like matrix things are less clear. And I feel they're more clear. So there you go. Uh, they're certainly much easier to do derivations on. And one of the derivations, which was the one I showed you last time, is <coughs> what happens when you center the distance matrix. So this centering operation, the centering matrix has this form, which we talked about last time. Uh, what this, if you multiply this by um, the matrix Y, uh, you get Y minus 1 over N times Y times 1. Now, Y times 1 just sums all the Ys together. And then this one transpose just maps that back out again. So that just means you've got eight y minus a vector. So you do this in MATLAB, right? You do this rep mat operation, this evil operation in MATLAB to center your data, copy the mean down 100 times to avoid using a loop. Isn't MATLAB a disgusting language? Um, and this is, in effect, the matrix way of writing that down. This isn't how you should compute these things. Uh, obviously, but it's a nice, convenient way of writing that thing you're doing in MATLAB if you're subtracting the mean from your data. And it's denoted in statistics H. It's called the centering matrix. And when you multiply H either side of these guys, it eliminates these two terms and just gives you this y hat, y hat transpose. So the centered square distance matrix is, is closely related to the centered similarity or kernel. <coughs> so I want to use an example of so you might think, well, what's all this distances he's going about? Well, here's a classic 
statistical example of when you get given distances and how you project them. So we redraw a road map, uh, a map from road distances. So what we're going to have is we're using distances across Europe, and all we know is city names and what the distance between uh, those different cities is, yeah? So that we can get a squared distance matrix. So we've got the distance between London and Edinburgh, Edinburgh and Paris, yeah, in terms of road distance to travel. Um, and you can, I've got some data there. Um, and then you can also know the actual location of these things. So what you can try and do is, well, you can visualize these distances, and ideally, they should look something similar to the map of Europe. So what we do is we enter all the road distances into the distance matrix. We square it, because we're using squared distances. And we convert to a uh, similarity matrix. OK, I haven't told you about the convariance interpretation, but uh, that will come up in a moment. We convert to the similarity matrix using this operation on the distances. And then you have to times it by minus 2. And then you do the eigen decomposition because we know that minimizes this entry-wise L1 norm, the mean absolute error between the distances in our latent space and the distances in the data space. Um, so this uh, covariance interpretation is just that conversion you've seen before. So uh, what you've got on the left is these are a visualization of road distances <coughs> between 48 cities in Europe. And then here is that transformation that I've been showing you on the first thing to a similarity matrix. So this one is zero along the diagonal, whereas this one has its largest values along the diagonal, although that's difficult to see. Uh, so each city is most similar to itself, but each city is closest to itself. So what you do is you do the eigen decomposition on that. Now, subject to a scaling and a rotation and a blah, 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 you recover a map. Now, there's something called a Procrustes rotation, which allows you to fit and recover the rotation and the scaling. And what you can see is, <coughs> as circles, you've got the real location of the city. And as a cross, you've got the location given by the road distance data. So Lisbon's actually uh, been removed to the north of Spain. and uh, sorry, Li sorry, Madrid's been moved to the north of Spain. Lisbon's out in the Atlantic. Malaga's out in the Atlantic. Unfortunately, we're off the map um, because don't tell the locals, but we're not actually in Europe. Um, uh, Helsinki moves. I mean, uh, Moscow moves. Uh, but, and then, OK, at the bottom here, we've got Athens moving uh, rather nicely for the Greeks into the middle of Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure that, I'll, <laughs> that does anyone any favors. Barcelona moves. Uh, the Catalans seem to move up to, uh, what are the other ones? Oh, that's bad. <laughs> the Basque country. <laughs> they have itself a few problems in Spain as well. <laughs> so, and, and, OK, these effects are because fundamentally, you know, actually it's interesting, a lot of the Alpine areas are, are close together. But the, the roads around here are, don't actually go straight. If the road distances were all straight, you would recover the exact map. But because they move around places like Alps and rivers and, and, and seas, then you get these effects where things aren't quite where they appear, or they have to go through the Channel Tunnel. Uh, yeah, Edinburgh's moved uh, close to London. That's good as well. OK, so that's the sort of effect. But one of the things you get from this is you get the eigenvalues of the matrix. So here's the eigenvalues. The first two eigenvalues are very large. This is predominantly two-dimensional data. But there's something funny going on, because actually the curvature of the Earth around Europe is significant. So you can't, as we know from mapping, in fact, this map is a Mercator projection. You can't actually take that little bit of Earth and properly flatten it down onto a Euclidean data space. So even ignoring the fact that the roads don't give you a Euclidean distance, because they don't satisfy uh, all the necessary uh, conditions, um, this map isn't going to be really Euclidean. So you're trying to visualize a Euclidean space, uh, sorry, a non-Euclidean space in a Euclidean space. And the effect you get is these negative eigenvalues. So because you can't actually do that, this, it turns out what's going on actually, what this means is this matrix of similarities isn't positive definite. What that means, uh, and you can read details about this in Mardia Kent Bibby, but these distances aren't Euclidean because they're road distances. And the, the way you see that is that when you go to the similarities, that that matrix isn't positive definite. So it's not a valid covariance. It's not a valid kernel, because it's got negative eigenvalues. Um, and when you do these little examples like this, that comes up. 
And the standard approach is just to ignore the negative eigenvalues and pretend they don't exist and visualize the larger ones. But it's quite a complex area, and you know, there was a uh, fellow in Manchester when I was there who focused their entire time on this and arguing that actually you need to spend a bit more time looking at these negative eigenvalues. But for our purposes, you can see these two dominant ones. It's, we might claim it's dominantly two-dimensional, the reason the eigenvalues are so large is the distances are in kilometers, and these are squared kilometers in effect. So you're talking distances of about tens of a thousand, so that's why they're so large. OK. But then here's the reconstructed distance matrix from those two eigenvalues. So looking at those two eigenvectors, you get a pretty good approximation, yeah? I mean, there, there are differences. That square there is darker than that square there, but, but it looks pretty nice. So that's, that's the fit that we've got from this uh, eigen decomposition. Okay, so you can use any similarity. You can also decide to start with similarities rather than start with distances. So that's very common in psychology. <coughs> so in psych uh, psychological testing, um, people are often asked uh, to gauge the similarity between two things. So the, there's examples where people say, how similar are these two colors? So there's the wavelength of color, but there's your perception of color. So people are interested in that. So they show you two colors, and you think red is similar to blue. Now, is red similar to blue? No. But perceptually, you have these funny little filters that your, I think your blue filter responds to red. It has a bizarre second bump in it. So perceptually, you think red and blue are similar. So psychologists are interested in that. So they ask you to score the similarity between red and blue, and people will score it high, and they'll score it between 0 and 1. And you can score all the different colors you get shown, and that builds directly a similarity matrix like that. And then you just do the eigen decomposition on that directly. You don't look at the distances. So that's a standard thing in classical multi-dimensional scaling, which is really what I'm sort of teaching here. Um, and you can make up whatever the similarity is. But very often, that won't be positive definite either. That comes up a lot in these uh, statistical uh, problems, in these, sorry, these uh, psych uh, social science and psychology uh, applications. But you can use basically the distance or similarity you want, though. But uh, you've got this problem that the similarity must be positive semi-definite for the distance to be Euclidean. So here's the uh, theorem in the Mardia book if you want more details of that. OK, so uh, it was a bit of a con, because I started out by motivating nonlinear dimensionality reduction with that six example. Then I talked about distances. And then I showed you a linear dimensionality reduction algorithm. So I think, though, that you can summarize the main contribution of the machine learning community in this area um, in this way. So this idea. So th there are nonlinear algorithms in statistics, but they're mostly iterative. And I should say, I'm not going to cover these iterative algorithms. Also, T-SNE, which is a really interesting and important algorithm in dimensionality reduction. It doesn't fit within the sort of story I'm telling. It's a good algorithm, though. Um, but I haven't fitted it in the story yet, so I'm not going to talk about that. All these iterative methods of multidimensional scaling. What I want to talk about, though, is the machine learning community's contributions and how they relate to what I've talked about. So here's an idea to get a nonlinear algorithm. So compute the distances in a space that's nonlinearly related to the original data. So we can use any distance we like. So why don't we map to a nonlinear space, compute the distances there, and then use the linear algorithm? So this is like the sort of trick that Bernard was talking about, where <coughs> you nonlinearize and then you do something linear in the nonlinear space. Same trick here. I'm going to introduce. It's not always the same trick in the way it's being applied, um, although the kernel people would tell you that. Now, the nice thing is Bernard's not here, so I can be very rude about kernel PCA as long as the camera's not switched off. No, I'm not going to be rude about kernel PCA because it's a very important algorithm. Um, and it does rely on this idea. But here's my interpretation of, of what's going on with it. Sorry, that should be fi and fj there. So, Let's not linearly map the data to a new space and compute the distances there. And we're going to do this using basis function models. I think that these are very nice, simple models, and I'll show an illustration of this type of idea in a moment. So we make fi a new representation of yi, and we say fi is a function of yi such that it's a linear sum of some basis functions computed at each yi, and there's m basis functions. 
And this is then the square distance between that should be fi and fj. OK? That was a late night notation change. Um, so a, a common basis function to use is this, what I like to call an exponentiated quadratic, uh, because it's not a Gaussian. It's also not a squared exponential. Uh, and some people don't like the term radial basis function. But it's got all these names. And it's uh, just, a, as we'll see in a moment, a sort of little bump. Now, and then we've got these elements of uh, these basis functions, which we can write as a matrix. And we tend to write these sort of things in the form of a design matrix with a set of vectors. So each column of this uh, design matrix gives you the evaluation of one of the basis functions or all the data, different data points. And there are m columns, one column for each uh, location where you've computed the basis function. So there's this location parameter, u, mu, which you have to make a decision about, and this width of the basis function. So for the moment, we're going to decide to just distribute basis functions uniformly along a one-dimensional input. We're going to actually assume that the data whose dimension we're re reducing is one-dimensional. I know that's a bit strange, but that makes it easier to plot. So <coughs> in matrix notation, as I said, or vector notation, we have this, that the... Um, function of the data is given by W transpose phi i, where this is um, uh, a, a row from, the, uh, from this design matrix here. So that's one of those rows, and W is the weighting of each row. OK, so we're going to do this mapping of the basis functions, but where we now introduce a set of new parameters, which is a little bit annoying, because what parameters should we use for computing this distance? Well. Let's just generate random functions and look at the expectation of these random functions. So we're not going to specify the uh, uh, values of W. We're just going to specify a probability density. And then we'll compute expected squared distances. Now, the nice thing is that Fi minus Fj squared is equal to this. So this is the basis function transpose W minus uh, the basis functions computed for the ith data point uh, in a product with W minus the basis functions computed at the J data point in a product with W, just using that notation there. Multiplying that bracket out, we can see it in this form. And now if we take the expectation of these square distances under P of W, and let's just assume that it's second moment, this distribution. We're not saying anything about this distribution. I haven't said it's Gaussian. I haven't said it's anything. All I'm saying so far is its second moment exists. And the second moment of that distribution is going to be i, the identity matrix. So the expected square distances under these random functions we're projecting is equal to this. The basis functions minus, uh, uh, computed at i minus the basis functions computed at j in a product with themselves. Uh, if we also said that the mean of this thing was 0, then the covariance of this distribution would be 0. Now, it, you could think it's Gaussian if you like, but I haven't said that. It could be anything at this stage. Actually, to show you sort of some illustrations, I'm going to assume it's Gaussian just because I have to sample from something. But it doesn't have to be Gaussian. <coughs> so here's a set of basis functions with, I think, width 1 and location parameter minus 1, 0, and 1. Yeah? So that's the design matrix is being computed now. This is a visualization of a design matrix for every point between minus 2 and 2. Yeah. So what am I saying? I'm saying, well, to compute the distances, we're going to sample a weight vector, three-dimensional weight vector in this case. It's going to weight that plus that plus that with some Gaussian weighting. And that will give us a function. And we'll compute distances on that function. So that's what that looks like. So here's our input. This is our original y. And we're mapping from that y to I've sampled 1w, and it's given me this function here. And the distance between these two is given by that. And what, we're, what we've written down is what the expectation of the square of that is, because we're interested in squared distances. Yeah? So we're mapping from input y to a not, in a nonlinear way to some space given by f, some function space. OK, so there's one sample but we're going to do over multiple samples. Now look at this. What's nice is that if these, because this is a smooth function, if these inputs are close together here, they're actually going to be close together in F as well. If they were further apart, 
So here, if they were at zero and minus two, then the distance would be that much greater. Not always that much greater, because it could, uh, but just by randomness, it could be closer. But on average, the distances will be that much greater. Yeah? Does that all make sense? Is that clear? So does this seem like a good idea? And then we'll compute distances in that space. So here's some other samples. Okay, that seems like quite a good idea. I quite like that idea. So we're going to then do classical multidimensional scaling on that space. There's a slight problem with that idea because we located our basis functions at minus 1, 0, and 1. So who can tell me what's going to happen if I have data points whose y value is minus 4 and 4? Yeah. Same distance. Yeah, well, they'll be 0 apart, won't they? Same small distance apart. So that's going to be pretty bad. So here you go. If we've got data points just outside the span of our basis functions, this doesn't work quite so well. These data points are a long way apart, but they'll always be zero distance apart in the new space f, which is annoying. So that's slightly problematic. So the distances there are small despite the data being far apart. So there's an issue there. And this is a side effect of bad basis function placement. Basically, if you put your basis functions over where your data was, this wouldn't happen. But that's actually a sort of bad thing to say because how do you know where your data is before you put your basis functions down? So what's the solution to this? Well, there's a lovely elegant solution, which is you sprinkle, and I mean sprinkle in the technical sense, um, you sprinkle your basis function across the entire space of Y. And how many sprinkles do you put? Well, you put down infinity of them, okay? Now, if it was a cake, that would be difficult, but this is maths, so it's possible. Um, this leads to kernel methods. So, what, this is a loose outline of what you do in order to do this, what you can show you're doing, is <coughs> if you decide to sort of start putting your basis functions at A, and then you start placing them at intervals of delta mu, so you basically, uh, this is across the real line, in practice, we're going to do this in a high-dimensional space, but for the moment, the high-dimensional space is one-dimensional. So this, just to be clear, that's a schematic. This is a one-dimensional input. In practice, this would be a high-dimensional input function, yeah? But I can't plot that so easily on the slide, so I'm doing one-dimensional for the plot. But also for this proof, using one-dimensional, if we have the location parameters in effect set to start at some point A and then add a little bit at each time, so we're basically uniformly spacing these basis functions out, this also works if you randomly distribute them as Gaussians, you get the same result. Um, then, because the distances in feature space are dependent only on the inner product between two basis functions, it turns out that you can decrease delta mu to increase the number of basis functions, and then you can also take the limits of where you put these basis functions to infinity, and you end up with the kernel. So the bit that I haven't, sorry, shown is that you can... You know, the key trick, he says, again, not prepared, is the those distances in uh, the expected distance between two data points in this function space is always given by the inner product, yeah, of these basis function vectors. And what's going on is this is the standard trick is the length of these guys is becoming infinity. But because they're both infinity, and you're only evaluating things in terms of the inner product, you rewrite what was phi of x uh, i, transpose phi of x j, you can rewrite it as a kernel function. Now that's one way of introducing the kernel trick that you may hear more about when John Cunningham talks about Gaussian processes, and you'll also hear a little bit more about from me. So that's what's going on with the kernel trick. And that's a more of a Gaussian process perspective on what the kernel trick is. So now we've got kernels. And what goes on in the kernel trick is that actually this kernel has interpretation as being the covariance of those functions we're computing, the direct covariance. So the reference missing there is uh, to Schulkopf and Smaller. But this is sometimes known as the kernel trick moving from this to this. Sorry, I used x when I wrote it on the I'm used to inputs being x, but here they're actually y. So this, uh, this KYY hatch has all the properties of a Mercer kernel, 
and it's also positive definite, so it actually has all the properties of what we call a covariance function. So a covariant function is a function that can be used to generate a covariance matrix. Um, and in fact, what's going on here is instead of, um, this is again the sort of Gaussian process point of view, instead of talking about functions like this, and then putting a prior over W, what we're actually doing is putting a prior on this guy directly. Now, we don't need to specify it's a Gaussian process because we only need the covariance of it, which is why I think people in the kernel community don't tend to like to specify a Gaussian process because then that means you're saying something about the other moments which you don't, in some sense, need to say to just look at kernel PCA. You can just talk about the second moment, the second moment being a kernel. Um, there is some utility to saying it's Gaussian because you can do a lot more calculations on the uncertainty. But let's accept that it doesn't need to be Gaussian for the rest of what I say to be true. So the mapping from data to distance is now a Gaussian process. And if we sample from this Gaussian process, what we see is now we've got these basis functions over infinite space. So it doesn't matter where you sample, you will see movement, you will see wiggle, because we've sprinkled these basis functions everywhere. And now the distances between 3 and minus 3 will give something reasonable. On average, they'll be far apart. On average, too close things will be close together. And that's because the function mapping is mapping from y to this f space in a smooth way. So there's some other samples. OK, so unfortunately, that doesn't come out very clearly. But <clears throat> that gives us now our distance matrix. So we can use the kernel trick what I've in some sense introduced in a roundabout, hopefully where you haven't seen before, is that the kernel trick on distances so this is the distance in the feature space is of this form here. Yi comma yi uh, minus 2k yi comma yj uh, sorry, that's plus, plus uh, kyj, comma yj. Now, in this case, if you look at what we wrote down before, where we had diag y, y transpose, 1 transpose in the matrix form, minus 2 y, y transpose, plus diag, sorry, plus 1 times diag y, y transpose, like that, if you look at that form and you now say, ah, oh, ah, oh, that's an inner product matrix. Ooh, 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 I know how to kernelize things. I can put a kernel in there instead of the inner product matrix. That's the same thing I've just shown you. What I've shown you is an interpretation of what you're doing if you do that. That also shows you that um, you can think of the distances you're computing as being linear mappings uh, in the standard PCA case to the latent space, which makes sense. Yeah? So here it's nonlinear mappings. So I'm just trying to give you other intuitions on what's going on in kernel PCA. So the result of that is to put the kernel matrix in here as computed at all values uh, sorry. like that. Now the cool thing about that is if we now apply our centering operation that we've been applying before, and multiply by minus 2, <coughs> what we recover is that the centered squared distance matrix is equal to, or minus, uh, minus 2 h k h. That baby there is what I've called B in my notation. It's the centered similarity matrix or the centered covariance function. And if you multiply it by minus half, as classical multidimensional scaling tells you to do, and do the eigen decomposition, you're doing kernel PCA. But you're doing it on a certain distance measure. Now, kernel PCA is special because kernel PCA comes with a mapping from the data to the latent space. So you don't just get the latent points. You get a, a mapping which tells you whatever y, where it maps to in x. Make sense? That's not true for classical multidimensional scaling. So kernel PCA is in some sense more general than classical multidimensional scaling because it comes with a map. 
So this procedure of just looking at, so Bernard, uh, when he introduced kernel PCA, looked at it from the PCA point of view, and it kernelized PCA, yeah? It does represent a theorem on various things. Here, I'm showing it to you from the distance matrix point of view, and it comes down to the same thing. But the additional feature of kernel PCA is you get this mapping, and that's important. That's not true of any other of the classical multidimensional scaling methods I'll mention, or any of the spectral methods I'll mention. Um, and the mapping comes about from this interpretation being, as what you're actually doing is mapping from, it's like, what you're doing is mapping to this space F and computing the distances there. And because you understand the relationship between those two, you can talk about where you are in the latent space. And you can't do that for distance measures you make up. OK, so what I'm showing here is the distance between, sorry, is the, uh, what I'm showing here is the similarity matrix. And it's very, clear for those rotated sixes. It's very unclear, I'm afraid. There's a light blue line going down here, uh, and then it's going up to red in the middle. It must be red right along the diagonal. But because there's 360 data points, and most of the, as you go around the images, because an upside down six is a long way under these basis functions from itself, You've got zero similarity between, uh, well, you've got similarity between 360 and zero, but between 90 and, say, 270, there's zero similarity. So most of the entries in this similarity matrix, the center similarity matrix will be zero, yeah? You only get a few entries along the diagonal if you use the basis I described, where you've computed that two data points are close together. So the analogy here under those basis functions is when you, what you're doing here is you're computing the kernel, but you've got two data points here. If they're close together, then they respond to each other under the nature of these basis functions. If they're a long way apart, there's no similarity between them. And I think you know that if you've computed kernels. Uh, so this is just the RBF kernel, or as I call it, the exponentiated quadratic, computed on that six data. And the width of the parameter I've used is fairly small. The reason I've used a small width parameter is I want to particularly illustrate the effect of, of when that happens. So neighboring, I mean, it's a nicely set up because neighboring uh, sixes are similar, but far apart sixes aren't similar. But we can, of course, talk about what the equivalent distance is, and that's even less clear. Huh. But see this black square here? <laughs> not that clear on my laptop, to be fair. Normally, you say, oh, it's really clear on my laptop, but it's OK. Uh, so in this case, when we compute the distance, and this is key for understanding what goes on in kernel PCA and why kernel PCA isn't doing dimensionality reduction. It's doing something useful and something good, but it's not dimensionality reduction. Um, and this is the point of this sort of little section. OK, apart from the diagonal there, where the distances are 0 and close to 0 along the diagonal, every other element in here is 0.4 something. What do you think it is if it's 0.4 something? Well, it's down there, isn't it? Square root of 2, uh, it's actually 1 minus, uh, square root of 2 minus 1. Uh, or, in fact, it should be 1 point. OK, something funny on there. It should be square root of 2, all these distances. And the reason is, because if you look at this similarity matrix I've shown before, <coughs> this is the squared distance, yeah? And the similarity, this basis function, the way we've set up, the diagonal is always 1, because it's 0 distance between the two data points, and it's e to the minus distance squared, yeah? So the diagonal, these guys are all matrices of 1s, and if you're dissimilar, this kernel in the middle gives you 0. So the squared distance is basically 2, and the square root of that is square root of 2. So I don't quite know what's going on with my color map, but all these distances for dissimilar points are the square root of 2. They're only not square root of 2 very much along the diagonal. Now, what was our error function for classical multidimensional scaling? And it's important to use this error function to understand why things go wrong from a dimensionality reduction perspective. The error function was mean absolute error of distances in latent space versus distances in data space. This is now a new set of distances in data space, although it's in this nonlinear related space that we're computing things on. So when we try and do the visualization, what are we trying to do? We're trying to minimize the mean absolute error between the distances we compute and these distances here, of which only order 360 
distances are not equal to square root of 2. All other distances are equal to square root of 2. So what's the embedding trying to do? It's trying to embed them all square root of 2 apart. Can you do that in a low dimensional space? So let me keep on that one for a moment. Can you embed, if I want to embed 360 data points square root of 2 apart, what size of space do I need to do that? Sorry? So I've got 100, if I've got one, if I, every data point has to be square root of 2 apart from each other, which is more extreme than what I've got here, how, how, what size of space do I need? I have to put it in 360 dimensional space. I can't do it any other way. Otherwise, some of those data points will be close together. So in the base case, if all your data points are similar, they will all be in a 360 dimensional space. And in fact, you can see that's going to be the case because the rank of this matrix here is actually 360 minus 1 because of the centering. Because the kernel matrix is full rank. So actually, when you do the um, eigen decomposition on this, you'll find that it's a dimensionality, it's not a dimensionality expansion here because we've got 3,600 3, input dimensions going down to a 360 dimensional data space. But if you had three data points, it would still be uh, a three, uh, sorry, if you had, if you, sorry, if you had five features in the data, it would still be a 360 dimensional data space. So kernel PCA is actually doing something different. What it's doing is feature extraction, and it's mapping your data to a high-dimensional data space, certainly with this covariance function. And because of the way these functions are set up, with pretty much any covariance function you can think of, which is a true covariance function. If we start making these things matrices, as we'll see later, not covariance functions, then things change. But in this case, you're doing dimensionality expansion. Um, and this is the result of the embedding. This is a classic. Uh, I think this is what John Platt wants. I need to ask John Platt about this. But before I sort of understood this effect that well, uh, John Platt was saying, oh, I think he's dealing with salt taffy effect. And I was like, salt taffy effect. And, he's, and I said, he said, oh, you know, where, where the arms of the embedding get pulled out. Because salt taffy, are there any Americans here? Explain what salt taffy, how you make it. You pull it. So it's some sort of toffee where you pull on it. And they sell it at the seaside. Uh, is that right? So you pull salt taffy to make the thing. And as you're pulling it, it all strings out. So this is salt taffy effect. And why is it doing that? Because, OK, these data points are actually similar. Because they're the, the, as, as we go around this thing here, we're going around the rotation of the rotated sixes. So these guys are actually similar. So they're not embedded square root of two apart. But this guy is trying to be square root of 2 apart from this guy, and square root of 2 apart from this guy, and so on and so forth. So the way you tend to do that is you go in and out of dimensions. Your neighbors, the ones who are genuinely close to you, um, you, you stay close to them. So when you look at this embedding in all its dimensions, it just keeps going out. And then this is the angle between these is about 90 degrees. It goes, and then same here, same here. So it goes out and back, out and back. And that 90 degree angle, and the fact that these things are sort of length one, keeps everything square root of two apart. Clever. But each of these things can actually be seen. This isn't dimensionality reduction. This is a dimensionality expansion. And you can visualize what these basis features are. And they're like features of the six. This one may be responding to the tail being up at the top, yeah? So it's saying that's on. So you've got all these sort of features of the six coming on at different times. And so it's a feature extraction method that you can then do good classification in. Something people used to do with kernel PCA is do kernel PCA and then do a linear classifier. It's another way of getting a nonlinear classifier. But it's not a dimensionality reduction technique. And just to show you, give a visualization of that shape, I've sort of put a couple of random permutations on it. So are there any questions about that? Uh, just a simple question, really. Um, about 10 slides ago, you were talking about the distances between rows. And, and then you said um, the eigenvalues are very big because uh, the distances are in hundreds of kilometers. But I was, I was always told that you have to kind of normalize and uh, reduce to kind of unit one. Yeah, yeah, you could do that, yeah. yeah. So it doesn't make any difference. Yeah, well, no, it makes it doesn't make any difference on a computer with infinite precision. <laughs> yeah, no, it does make it does. Uh, yeah, you're right. You should do that. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so it, it shouldn't. 
Mm, you, you should, you feel right that you should try and normalize data in order just to keep the computer operating in the regime where it's got most precision. But I mean, for this example, it doesn't uh, make that much difference. Um, okay. So that's Colonel PCA. Um, ah, excellent. He's disarrived. <laughs> Don't tell him what I said. <laughs> so. Um, what I want to do next is talk about spectral techniques. Um, and I've got sort of 10 minutes before I want to do the break, so we'll see for how far I get through these examples. But the um, spectral approach to dimensionality reduction, the first example of it in machine learning is kernel PCA. Um, but the way these other techniques that are quite well known, isomap, locally linear embeddings, Laplacian eigenmaps, maximum variance unfolding, operate is somewhat different uh, to PCA, and they do lead to a reduced dimensional representation rather than this expanded uh, uh, feature set. Um, so my favorite example to start with is classical multidimensional scaling. So again, that's just a review of the CMDS stuff. But what I want to do is talk about isomap, because isomap is really closely related to that city distance example. So in the city distance example, we computed the distance between <coughs> all um, the cities in Europe, the 48 that we had, and then we did classical multidimensional scaling on the resulting distance matrix. Now, isomap is something different. What isomap, what you can think of, is think of every data point you have as being a city in a high dimensional space. Then, build roads from each of those data points to its neighboring cities. So you define your neighborhood some way, K nearest neighbors is very common. So you say, if I look at the seven nearest neighbors, I connect them by roads, straight roads, like the Romans. Yeah? So the Roman roads between all these neighboring cities. And then you say, let me compute the road distance between every city, which is now a data point, and compute a distance matrix from that. Really elegant, simple idea. Now, because you can't go between non-neighbors directly. You have to travel along the straight roads uh, between the different cities, right? Now, that's an approximation to sort of manifold distance. So you should never do anything on the Swiss roll, by the way. This is just an illustration. Amen. <laughs> the Swiss roll is not a real data set. <laughs> no one ever comes to you with a 1,000 data points in three dimensions and says, please reduce the dimensionality of this data. It's extremely unrealistic. I do not blame them for publishing this in the first place. It's an excellent illustrative example. But there used to be something called the Zor problem. You heard, who's heard of the Zor problem? That would be an interesting. One person's heard of the Zor problem. Like the Zor problem was like a classification problem in machine learning, which uh, uh, all the elder gents will remember very well, which was that like, let's see, I probably can't even do it right. So this is like a Zor gate. And the point is, you can't linearly separate. No linear classifier will give you the right answer. Challenging, isn't it? <laughs> OK? Now, if someone used that problem to illustrate the issue with linear classifiers, yeah? And then it became like every paper had to show how their nonlinear classifier solved the Zor problem. It was never a serious problem. It was an illustration of a point which was a valid point to illustrate. That's the same with the Swiss roll. It's not a massive, it's funny, in, um, if you go into like applied or pure math talks, they'll say, and now we're going to go to an application of this spectral stuff, which is this important Swiss roll <laughs> that in machine learning is very much studied because people need to unravel it. Um, <laughs> It's just not a real data set. And actually, I mean, unless you're doing something, you want to show something like that when you get holes in it, some effect, some illustrative effect, which has also been used for, fine. But please try and do uh, dim dimensionality reduction on real data. Um, and you know, I almost switch. I don't even read the section on Swiss roll. But it's useful for the first papers that used it, which was 12 years ago. So it's like the Zor problem. It was useful. And we used to teach about the Zor problem as well when we were talking about classification. And it's still useful as a concept, you know, that it's a nonlinear manifold. You can see it's two dimensional. And it's useful for showing this idea of the cities. Here's the road network connecting all these cities, which are the data points together. And what you're really interested in is the distance 
along this plane, yeah? So that's like the distance along the Earth, the surface of the Earth that you're interested in when you drive around Europe or over the mountains. Um, that's what you're interested in, but you can't quite compute that, so you approximate it by these roads that are connecting all the data points together. Now, even in this very well sampled uh, manifold, this is extremely well sampled. Consider it's in three dimensions, and there's a bunch of data here. Look at the big holes that appear in the, the road network. That can have some funny effects. But this is, I mean, this is, I think, my favorite uh, of the spectral dimensionality reduction methods, because it's so simple and it works. It works quite nicely. So just to illustrate what goes on and what can go wrong in that, so construct nearest neighbors for each data point. So here is a manifold I've generated. I used a Gaussian process to generate it. Hopefully you can see what sort of shape it is, even though it's a three, it lives in a sort of, it's a 2D manifold living in 3D. So it's some sort of sheet like this. Um, and because I generated it in the latent space, I know the neighborhood in the latent space, so I can draw it. And that's really what you're interested in. So you want to know the distance between these two points, but we're not allowing more than four neighbors. So the approximation to this is to go along this neighbor, this neighbor, this neighbor, this neighbor. Yeah? That's very nice. And you can compute that. And there's these funky algorithms, Floyd's and something else, for computing these things fast, relatively fast at any rate. And you get the distance between these two guys, and then you do your classical multidimensional scaling. Um, so that works really well. But one of my main arguments and my main problems with spectral methods is if you knew this neighborhood, which is the neighborhood in data space, you've probably got your dimension in latent space, not in data space. It's the neighborhood in X. Then it's probably a problem solved already. That's actually the most difficult part, to understand who's neighboring who in the latent space. And we don't know that, so we use a proxy. And the proxy is who's neighboring who in data space. And that's what that looks like for this really simple set up, where the points are very well sampled. So these are the four nearest neighbors. I even know that there's four nearest neighbors here because I've done the, I generated the manifold myself. It's even very nicely sampled in a regular way. Yeah? This is sort of, it should be ideal circumstance. But when I compute the four nearest neighbors, this one, its four nearest neighbors happen to be down here, just because of the way the manifold folded together. And we compute it in, because. Uh, the distance is jumping over a fold in the manifold, yeah? Not following the distance along the manifold. So there's a little fold, a dip going down there and coming up. You can see it as these points get closer together. And that means that the fourth nearest neighbor to that one is that one. You probably, even yourselves, are thinking, that can't be right, it's gotta be that one. Because you're perceptually embedding your vision onto the manifold that you can see is there. Because you don't have a knowledge of 3D. But the real distances look like this. So when you compute the distance between that one and that one, you get that. So that's a big problem. And that's a problem for all these methods. And in fact, the methods are simple because they ignore that problem. Really, dimensionality reduction is not a convex problem. It's convex if you assume you have the right graph and do what's going to follow. So I'll just show you quickly um, the results of uh, that stickman data. So this is nice. Uh, this is a lovely visualization. So you build a neighborhood on the graph there, you compute these distances, and you just do CMDS on the resulting graph. This is, our, this is one of my favorite visualizations of that stickman data, done by a spectral method at any rate. Uh, in the data, I'm gonna finally, as a reward for your perseverance, I hope show you what the data looks like, which I meant to do last time. So uh, this is the data. Um, so it's this guy running, but I mean, importantly, if I can actually turn that around. Ah, ah. Okay, so he starts at some funny angle, then he gets straighter and straighter, and he starts in a funny position. Let's see, repeat that. So you've got this periodic nature to the data, but this changing angle, and also he starts in this funny pose that he never uses in the run, as you do when you start running. Um, so all that comes out in the uh, visualization. This is him starting in this funny pose. And this is him starting his run. And then that's three strides of the run. And it's not embedded them totally on top of each other because the angle's different. 
But it has to, because it's put them in two dimensions, it has to do something sort of incorrect here. These three points do not map in data space to the same thing. They're slightly different positions. But it has to make some compromise like that. So that's a nice embedding of that data. Um, this is the oil data. This is a bit of a funny embedding. The, the graph is disconnected actually on this, so some of the blue points are missing. Um, and this is a problem. When you connect, you do your neighborhood graph, you connect all the points together. If some don't actually connect with the points that you've been connecting, they live on a separate graph. How, how do you plug them back together? Yeah? So if you're doing K nearest neighbors, it doesn't guarantee a fully connected graph. Um, actually, Isomap does a nice job with the partially connected part, um, which other algorithms don't do, and I had to increase the neighborhood massively in order to get a fully connected graph and a nice result out of some of the other algorithms. But in this disconnected portion, it has separated red and green. These were the laminar and annular flows that were overlapping in PCA. So it separated uh, red and green. It's just lost some of the blue. The blue that was sort of down at the bottom of the image before. I mean, I know exactly what the oil data looks like visualized by PCA. So I'm just saying that as if you all do, you've all remembered from yesterday. But uh, yeah, basically on the original visualization, uh, What we had was something like, uh, I can't remember which was which, but red and green were like this. Oh, bugger. Uh, red and green were something like that. And then we had like, I don't know, a splob of blue, and then we had some blue and blue and blue. And these guys have fallen off the graph. So we're just visualizing, in effect, that bit, which was very much overlapping in the linear model um, in two dimensions. But here it's not. It's, it's, broadly speaking, separated. Uh, and what I want to do is, okay, just show you the gene expression. I don't think I see much structure in that. I'm not going to pretend I do. Um, and then, uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I'm still quite close to the women. Uh, I'm also close to the Scottish, and this is a Glaswegian accent. So I'm assuming from this that uh, Mark and I sound very, very similar. Uh, <laughs> Um, so, you know, I don't, you can't tell much from this, actually. This doesn't look that much different. The reason is because if you look at vowel structure, the dominant difference between is, is, is the principal component dimension, the pitch difference between men and women. And actually, to start seeing interesting structure, you have to take the men out and visualize them separately. So in these first two dimensions, all ISMAP is doing is PCA. And that's something to watch out for, actually, because the, the, you know, the, it's, the, just the, it's just recreating a PCA-type solution, which it will do in the limit as you make the neighborhood fully connected. It just gives you PCA. Why is that true? Because as you make that neighborhood fully connected, the shortest path is just the Euclidean distance between every data point, and that was principal coordinate analysis. So oddly, as you increase, well, not oddly, naturally, as you increase the neighborhood, you just recover PCA. And <clears throat> For a lot of data, be very careful of this. Don't look at your data and go, oh, look, look, isomaps recovered some exciting nonlinear direction without actually just doing PCA and seeing if you get the same thing out. I mean, all this stuff where people are looking left to right in face things, you get a lot of visualizations of faces. If people look left to right, the lighting changes if they've got some frontal lighting. And the image tends to go from black and white to uh, white and black, sort of moving like that. And that's the dominant principal component. And everyone goes, oh, look, my moles recovered people looking left to right. Yeah, well, PCA would recover that as well. And actually, it's covering lighting variation on the center of the face. So be very, very careful about um, over-interpreting nonlinearity. Here, I think, it's just capturing this pitch, which is basically a linear, or broadly linear, transformation. So it's not doing anything much interesting. So uh, we'll, take a, we'll do some questions there and take a quick break. So multidimensional scaling on the shortest path approximation of geodesic distance uh, gives really nice embeddings. But this can inc involve require the solution of a very large eigenvalue problem because these distance matrices are very large. Um, if you've got 1,000 data, they're 1,000 by 1,000. And it's a, it's a dense eigenvalue problem. So there aren't really efficient approaches to solving it. And these eigenvalues are negative, can be negative. Actually, you know, <clears throat> I used to think of this as a disadvantage. But I'm now starting to think of it as an advantage. And I believe there is a paper AI stats, which is a really good conference with excellent selection of papers. Um, unless yours was rejected when it was an error on our part, and I apologize. Um, the, 
in that paper shows an equivalence between maximum variance unfolding, one of the algorithms we'll talk about later, an isomap. Um, and shows that basically the main difference between them is maximum variance unfolding places a further constraint that the distances have to be Euclidean. Um, and I'm not so sure if that's a good constraint or not. I don't know. It does lead to these negative eigenvalues that are difficult to interpret, but it's actually a characteristic of your data. I mean, genuinely, you can't embed Europe on a two-dimensional space without... I mean, and, and seeing that that's the case is potentially a useful thing. So I don't know. I, I don't know whether that's a disadvantage. It's a characteristic. But it's one of my favorite dimensionality reduction algorithms, anyway. Um, OK, so we'll take that. Take questions now, and uh, then, then a short break. So questions about what we've seen so far. So young, young John, yeah. <laughs> so if, uh, if you're getting these negative eigenvalues, I mean, how, how can you improve matrix this MDS? Well, uh, the problem is... What, what are the assumptions that are, are, are hindering it actually being a, a more complete solution? Um, the, uh, there's an answer coming in from Fernando <laughs> on the phone. <laughs> Someone's Someone watching on the video. <laughs> Don't trust Neil with that answer. Um, the, the, the issue is that you're trying to, in the latent space, you're trying to construct a bunch of distances that are Euclidean in nature. Naturally, because you said I'm going to embed in these two-dimensional space. And you're trying to match them to a space which is not necessarily Euclidean. It could be a sphere or anything. Um, which means that you won't get an ex ever an exact match between the distances. And actually, the assumptions underlying... Um, I think there's hidden assumptions that these things should be Euclidean. So the error... Remember, the error that I was talking about that you get for that mean absolute error is the sum of the discarded eigenvalues, uh, which is problematic if those eigenvalues are negative. So that clearly doesn't work anymore. So there's just failings in the entire framework uh, of classical multidimensional scaling if, if those distances aren't Euclidean. Other questions? No, it's, uh, no, they're not. Um, uh, I mean, I'm no expert on space-time, but I believe that has a negative eigenvalue because it's curved as well. Any non-Euclidean space can potentially have... The reason... So the Gaussian perspective I'm giving is a Euclidean perspective. Um, and, you know, as soon as you go non-Euclidean... I mean, the, the proof that a space is Euclidean is that its covariance function is... Uh, Positive, the, the, sorry, the corresponding uh, similar, uh, the, uh, similarity metric is Euclidean, is that it's positive definite. And then it can be embedded in Euclidean space. The, the distance measure is It doesn't matter. You could also start with the similarity. It doesn't matter whether you convert with the distance. It means that you, it means the distances were non-Euclidean. Well, the centric operation. Pardon? Do you, do you always work with centric, centered uh, values, centered similarity, centered distances? Is it because of that? Uh, no, no, no. It's because the distances are non-Euclidean. Yeah, but higher dimension than the. Yeah, but then you can't get more dimensions than the number of data points, can you? I mean, okay, I don't want to go into details because the the reference I gave is here, um, and I don't think it helps at all with the intuition. It will be, unless it's Euclidean, you will potentially get negative eigenvalues, and it's not down to noise. It's down to, you know, if you do it on the sphere, very densely sampled, you'll get the same thing. So, the bit that talks about it, the oldest reference that talks about it, although all the modern references will talk about it, in Isomap there'll be stuff, is this reference here. 
Oh, there we go. Yeah, 14.22 in Mardia. I don't really, you know, it takes me a long time to read Mardia and understand it and convert it into intuitions. I believe it when I read it. I don't know the intuitions behind that theorem, so I'm not presenting them. But I'm trying to focus on this, the intuitions. But there, it is, it is there, um, the details of why that happens and how that happens. But it's not the noise, it is the underlying space. <coughs> okay, any other questions? Right, so let's take a, how are we doing for time? Uh, oh, that's that excellent time. Um, so uh, should we take a, a five minute break and then uh, back here ten pa five past ten?